The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, that's better. Now, I, you should be able to hear me. I was muted. Can I get a show of hands if you can hear me and see the closed captioning is working? All right, that's better. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. Uh, good, good. I see a yes to both. Okay, good. All right. That's fantastic. Thanks, Zoe, for the mention there and a, a show of hands if you um just give me a, a quick hand raise there if you can see the closed caption and hear okay wonderful <clears throat> all right i am going to turn off the questions during the presentation just so that there are minimal distractions uh, i am going to go ahead and put our survey in the chat box below um, on the toolbar here. Again, it's in the chat box. For those of you um, who could please take the time to fill that out. The only way we can improve our education for you uh, is if you fill that survey out. Again, it's in the chat box. It's just a link for a survey, a Qualtrics survey, so that we know how we're doing and we can improve our education for you guys, okay? Uh, so just take a few moments at the end of this um, presentation and that would be uh, very much appreciated. All right, so without further ado, welcome to National Government Services uh, GoToWebinar. We are brought to you by NGS Medicare University we're going to go ahead and jump right into our hospice general inpatient care topic today. My name is Erin Musumichi. I am the one of the clinical uh, outreach and education educators. Oh, wow. Look at how that uh, closed captioning butchered my name there. That's great. Uh, we are going to, again, jump right in here. And at the end of the presentation, this is a short um, right to the point topic, and we will get into some questions, some Q&A, okay? All right. So we'll just take a quick peek at our disclaimer, which we always do. Um, we are giving you the material, um, well, as it was created, the material was up to date, um, but you can hop on out to the CMS website for current Medicare regulations. Let's take a look at our objective. We're gonna define the hospice general inpatient level of care today and highlight clinical documentation required by hospice physicians to support that GIP level of care. All right, and there is to be no recording as always of our webinars or education. <clears throat> and again, my name is Erin Musumichi. I'm one of the outreach and education consultants here at NGS. And let's look at our agenda. We're just gonna touch real quick on those level of care uh, revenue codes for hospice, really, really brief. Uh, and then we're gonna go right into uh, what is general inpatient care and some documentation examples. We'll talk about the references and resources and then we'll do a little Q&A at the end. All right, so 
hospice level of care, or the, as we like to call it for short, the acronym LOC revenue codes. I am not a billing subject matter expert. However, I think it's really important for clinicians uh, in the hospice field providing care and documenting in that medical record to have a basic understanding of how these levels of care are billed. And I know that for uh, firsthand because I was, in fact, also a hospice clinician, clinician uh, home health clinician at one point in my career. So I just want to provide a real high level overview of those revenue codes just so everyone has that understanding, which I'm sure the majority of you on the call probably do. Um, but just, you know, again, it's always good to refresh and go over these and you know, talk about what they represent from that claims perspective. Uh, there are four levels of care that can be billed for hospice and often, um, you know, newer clinicians or, you know, some clinicians are just not aware of the billing aspect of claims. I know I wasn't um, at one point and I have to, you know, refresh my memory sometimes as well. And I look to my colleagues and you know, I, I have to look things up all the time. So <clears throat> today we'll just go over some of those high level um, billing aspects in an effort to provide a better understanding of how clinical documentation plays a vital role and how that GIP level of care is billed by the hospice agency. So when an agency submits a claim to Medicare, they enter codes into the system to tell a story of what services they're, they're requesting payment for. Uh, the codes that they enter are subject to units of service performed. So if we look at, let's say, uh, routine home care uh, or RHC, as we like to call it for short, this is billed using revenue code 0651. Uh, and one unit is billed for each day that routine home care is provided. However, as you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, from the table on the slide, Continuous home care or CHC is billed with revenue code 0652. And every one unit is equal to 15 minutes of service. Meaning if the hospice provided one hour of service, they would bill four units. There are other coverage and billing requirements for billing continuous home care, but this is just an easy example of how to bill units for 15 minute increments of service. Uh, inpatient respite care or RIC and general inpatient care GIP are also billed with revenue codes as shown in the table above or on your slide here um, to indicate the service and uh, they're also billed with one unit for each day like the routine home care is as well uh, when the service is rendered. <clears throat> Whenever the different hospice levels of care are delivered they are placed on the claim and there's a revenue code and unit that goes with each one, as you can see from the table here. So clinicians should be mindful that they're always documenting to reflect that specific level of care they're providing. There's, uh, this is another reason why we should always avoid that copy paste method of documentation. That's just a great um, way to avoid um, or easily avoid errors, uh, as well as, you know, prevent denials. So for today's discussion, we're going to focus on the general inpatient level of care, or as we often reference it for short, GIP. And so for any of you that are billers on today's um, webinar, you'll use that REV code 0656. And again, it's billed as one unit equals one day on the hospice claim. And for anyone that would like more information or more in-depth information on hospice billing and revenue codes, I do have that hyperlink down there on the bottom of the slide <clears throat> for that hospice billing codes and level of care revenue codes. And that's a great job aid out on our uh, website that will give you more in-depth information on billing. Okay. All right. So GIP is a hot topic for providers right now. And it is still one of the top edits and denials um, per our medical review department. So, you know, we, you can see that right in our um, TPE um, top edit and denial section of our website. So 
GIP is necessary when your patient is having uncontrolled pain or crisis or, sim or requires symptom management that um, needs that intensity of care that can only be provided in an acute care hospital um, or setting or SNF uh, inpatient setting. So that medical condition condition warrants a short-term inpatient stay for pain control or acute or chronic symptom management. And again, per, you know, meetings, reports, discussions with our MR department, it is currently one of the top um, hospice edits. And those um, codes are 5C like Charlie, N like Nancy, G like George, X, and 5W, N like Nancy, G like George, X. Okay, those are the codes for the GIP greater than seven days. And this was implemented um, back in February of 2023. <clears throat> so when you're considering GIP for your hospice patient, you should be asking yourselves, what symptoms need to be managed that cannot be feasibly provided in any other setting or in the other settings? So current uh, TPE topics uh, that are under review can be found on our website again, and make sure you're heading out to look at those targeted probe and educate review topics, okay? And um, just remember also, Similar to respite, as with any inpatient stay for the hospice patient, the stay needs to follow the already established written plan of care and be sure to send with the, the, your patients um, and review upon reporting off to that inpatient facility staff. So make sure that you're you know, in constant communication. All right. So we previously reviewed that uh, GIP is provided only when the beneficiary requires an intensity of care directed towards pain control and symptom management that cannot be managed in any other setting, right? So what are those symptoms that we're trying to manage that cannot be easily provided in any other setting? So here they are on your screen. So <clears throat> Things like uncontrolled pain, IV narcotics, which require things like teaching, monitoring, assessment, and reassessment of response to those medications. With your cancer patients, you'll see things like pathological fractures, sudden deterioration, and or uncontrolled nausea, and or vomiting. Those things often require interventions that cannot be provided in the home setting. Respiratory distress, which becomes unmanageable open lesions requiring frequent skilled care, traction and frequent repositioning requiring more than one staff member, complex wound care requiring complex dressing changes, severe agitated delirium or acute anxiety or depression secondary to end stage disease process requiring extensive intervention. The key is looking for the symptom changes and then the teaching providing skilled intervention and or medication administration, observation and monitor, monitoring, followed by assessment and documentation of those changes, of course. And it's what is gonna support, <clears throat> it's what will support this as a need for GIP. Now, uh, documentation should, should support the event or intensity of care and change that drove the patient to need the GIP. So example, pain crisis, monitored, assessed, and treated with changes in medication regimen. Documentation should reflect every aspect of the medication adjustments, interventions, and stabilization treatments. And as previously stated, when discussing an um, IRC episode, documentation collaboration between the inpatient facility and the hospice agency may support the certification of terminal illness. 
it is suggested that the hospice agency obtain and submit the inpatient facility medical records. Because again, a simple note by the hospice nurse that states the patient was admitted to uh, general inpatient may not be enough to support that GIP level of care. For example, if medication changes occurred due to increasing pain upon transport to the inpatient facility or while that patient was admitted during uh, a general inpatient stay, or if the patient had an exacerbation of signs or symptoms of their primary diagnosis during their general inpatient admission, it would be important to include uh, you know, medical records from the inpatient facility support to support the changes in the patient's condition. And examples of documentation to include for GIP level of care may include uh, your ambulance records, your inpatient nursing and physician notes, uh, vital sign and uh, inpatient and outpatient records, pain scales, um, admitting H&P, your discharge summary, uh, any frequent evaluations by uh, the MD or nurse at the facility, any aggressive symptom management records or med administration records, or, or if there were frequent med uh, adjustments, any IVs that cannot be administered at home, or complicated technical delivery of medication, such as like a PCA or um, a special IV pump. Um, this is a um, basically a scenario, and um, we can pick this apart. Um, and I'm just going to basically read it. Um, but the bottom line here is we're going to decide: is this um, appropriate for GIP? So, a 72-year-old female with a history of lung cancer with metastases has elected to discontinue treatments and pursue comfort measures, wishes to be home. The patient has lost 30 pounds in the past three months, and she has become increasingly weak per caregiver, receiving IV fluids via right chest wall port. <clears throat> she has become increasingly agitated, rates pain 10 out of 10, increased from 7 out of 10 one hour ago during assessment and last PRN pain med administration. Respirations are increased from 20 to 30 breaths per minute. She is diaphoretic and complaining of chest tightening. Adjustments to medications have not been effective at home. Med administration record shows changes in medication. All PRN doses have been administered. Patient denies any relief of pain following last PRN pain med. Signed, Nice Nurse RN. So, do we think this? is appropriate for GIP level of care. Well, we could pick this note apart all day long. Um, you know, we don't see any anti-emetics listed, but I think this would still classify as appropriate for GIP level of care. Um, her pain is clearly not being managed and she has pretty significant change in symptom management that her caregiver will most likely not be able to handle. So you could call a family meeting and possibly have the social work come in, social worker come in and discuss options. However, the patient has not made it clear, um, I'm sorry, has made it clear that she wants to be comfortable and she's currently not, and that's the priority, right? So most likely this could be handled quicker and more efficiently in an inpatient setting. And, uh, where there's more resources available. All right, so potential GIP issues. Um, at the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that GIP was a hot topic for providers. So I wanted to revisit a few potential issues that we're seeing with this level of care. Um, and those are listed here on the slide. So again, um, general inpatient care uh, or general inpatient level of care greater than seven days, 55H1M um, is still one of the top J6 and JK edits for TPE medical review. So be mindful of your level of care as well as uh, your length of stay. 
Um, these types of facilities typically are not required to provide, quote, skilled care as part of the room and board and often do not meet um, staffing requirements for GIP level of care. So in your CMS IOM publication 100-04, Medicare Claims Processing Manual, Chapter 11, Section 30.1, levels of care data required on the institutional claim to Medicare contractor. It states, payment at the inpatient rate is made when general inpatient care is provided at a Medicare certified hospice facility, hospital, or skilled nursing facility. Therefore, it would, be, uh, would not be appropriate to provide a GIP level of care in a non-SNF. However, some nursing facilities are duly certified as a SNF in a nursing facility. So in this instance, when the Benny requires a GIP level of care and all COPs are met as a SNF, and the SNF is providing these services, the hospice provider could bill for a GIP level of care. So make sure you're staying up to date um, on your current JK and J6 medical review topics, okay? Again, visit our targeted probe and educate page on our website. Um, <clears throat> and those are always listed and up to date there. All right, and just another um, slide on documentation tips. Uh, documentation should be done at a minimum daily, but as frequently as needed or applicable, depending on the nature of the crisis or symptomology event slash event. Um, in, the, in the GIP situation. Uh, quantitative data shows the downward trajectory, which is how we support our CTI or the CTI in, in, this, in the situation. Um, so discharge planning should be constant and ongoing. Most or a lot of plans, um, not just Medicare, don't pay for a day of discharge. And this is not something new. And, and anyone who's been in the medical field uh, knows that. So that is not new. All right, just quickly references, um, COPs, hospice care, specifically 42 CFR 418.108 is where you're gonna find information on uh, your inpatient regs. And then your CMS um, IOM publication 100-4 Medicare Claims Processing Manual Chapter 11, um, that's where I got the information on billing for um, inpatient, general inpatient, and also the other levels of care. And then your Medicare Benefit Policy Manual, Chapter 9, coverage of hospice services under hospital insurance. And then, of course, our website has a plethora of information, job aids, uh, webinars, and computer-based training. Um, you'll find information there. Um, you can uh, definitely head on out to our podcast. We always have new episodes posting there. Please check that out. And then uh, links to our YouTube, Medicare Mobile, Medicare University, and LinkedIn, and ngsmedicare.com, link to our website, NGS Connects, and sign up for email updates if you have not done so. All right, let's look at our question box. I'm going to, yep, looks like, <laughs> I thought I shut it off, but it's it's going. All right. Kelly says, I believe that the slides will be posted on the NGS site, but will the actual webinar where you are speaking also be uploaded? You know, that's a great question. I don't believe um I I don't believe the one I did last week has been uploaded yet, but I will double check on that when we're done here. Um, it usually takes a, a couple of weeks for those to get uploaded. So we do have our on-demand YouTube library, um, and those are where these webinars get posted with the, the captions. And I, I apologize for the one I did last week, the captions were not working, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but it, you will hear my voice uh, if that helps. Um, and I did put the handout of these slides, which is also available on the events page. And those usually stay posted for about six months. But if you look in your GoToWebinar toolbar in the handout section, you will find the PDF version of this um, webinar the slides. 
And next question, Sheila, does the hospice have to offer continuous care in place of GIP and document the same? And the reason for GIP in place of continuous care? Um, Sheila, that's a, a good question, but I, I don't know as though they have to. And are you referring to continuous care if they don't have anywhere to go? once GIP is exhausted, uh, could you be more specific? I don't know if you hear me, Sheila. No, just offering both. Hmm. No, I don't believe they have to, no, I, but I will double check on that. I'm not 100% sure. Continuous care. Are you asking, I guess I should clarify, if it's a um, SNF nursing facility, does the hospice have to offer continuous care in place of GIP and document same and the reason for GIP in place of continuous care? Hmm. Is the, is the patient, is this a, like a scenario type of situation, Sheila, where the patient's already there? I guess I'm a little... No, I get the sniff versus, uh, I see. We had a member get a few ADR, not a sniff or NF. A home PT. Hmm. Yeah, maybe um, send me an email to the the um, NGS HHH PO mailbox, and we can look into it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> It'd be better if we had more info. All right. And what is this other question? Helpful hints about documentation for a patient that is in the hospital already and then needs GIP level of care for uncontrolled symptoms in the hospital already, uh, meaning starting an election for hospice and didn't go home yet and then needs GIP, I guess be more specific, Mary, if you don't mind. Okay, so in the hospital, getting ready to start the benefit and then ends up needing GIP level. Okay, um, I don't, you know, I guess. That would be, you know, up to the. Um, Is if as long as the hospital is contracted with that that has a contract with that hospice, then it's a documentation thing. I if they have elected hospice and they're already there, I don't see what the issue would be. They are in the hospital for a few days and then start to drastically decline with multiple symptoms. So they call hospice. Right, I, so you said they elected hospice though. I, got, I guess now I'm confused again. Can you provide any helpful hints about documentation for a patient that is in the hospital already and then needs GIP level of care for uncontrolled symptoms? Are they on hospice already? I guess I'm confused. 
they are in the hospital for a few days and then start to drastically decline with multiple symptoms, so they call hospice. You know what, if you could explain that, no, not on hospice until we are called. Patient admitted directly from hospital to hospice then is admitted to hospital or hospice in hospital when a contract is provided. Okay. Patient admitted directly from hospital to hospice then is admitted to hospice in hospital. Right, then is admitted to hospice in hospital where contract is provided. Yep. Thank you, Melissa. I was just about to say that. Good physician certification and RN and take note explaining uncontrolled symptoms and interventions that have not been effective. Yes, I was just going to say because we're wrapping up and at the end of our time to explain it in an email um, and send it to the shared mailbox, but um, I just reiterated what our um, friend from a different department said. Good physician certification and RN intake note explaining uncontrolled symptoms and intervention that have not been effective. All right, I'm going to take this last question and then we're going to have to end for today. So any questions following this webinar or related to this webinar will need to be sent to ngshhhpoe at elevancehealth.com. Um, can GIP level hospice care be provided in hospital setting? Yes, general inpatient level of care can be provided in a hospital setting. That's what it is. GIP, yes. Okay, folks, that will be it for today. I'm going to go ahead and conclude our webinar. Thank you all so much for joining and I hope to see you again next time at our next Hospice Lunch and Learn. Check out our events page for the next time and date for that. Take care everyone. Be safe.